Please pray with me. Lord, I pray today that your word might be like a rock in the wilderness from which waters of life stream and teem to bring us hope and joy, to make us the community for which you have created us to be for the world. Amen. Our second lesson is from the book of Exodus, chapter 17, verses one to seven. From the wilderness of Sin, the whole congregation of Israel camped in the wilderness by stages as the Lord commanded them. When they came to Rephidim, there was no water for them to drink. And so they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses responded saying, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test God? But the people thirsted for water there. And so they complained again to Moses saying, why did you bring us out of Egypt just to kill us and our children and our livestock of thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, What am I supposed to do with these people? They're about to stone me. And the Lord answered, saying, Go, walk out in front of the people and take with you some of the elders of the people of Israel. Take also with you the staff with which you struck the Nile, and I will be standing there in front of you on the rock. Strike the rock and water will come out from it, enough water for all the people to drink. And so Moses called that place Masa and Mirabah, meaning the people tested and quarreled against the Lord and said, is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Imagine that for 400 years we have all been slaves in Egypt. 10 generations of 100 hour work weeks. Your father, your great grandmother, your child, all they know is the reality of enslavement to Pharaoh. But out of nowhere, one day, God shows up. And through a series of mighty acts, God sets all of us free. And so as we begin to walk through the waters of the Red Sea toward our freedom, we notice that Pharaoh's chariots are in our view view mirror. But then God moves the waters and they sweep away Pharaoh and all of the symbols and memories of our slavery and they sweep them away. With our first seconds of freedom, we throw a party. And so there on the shore of the Red Sea, people dust off their instruments, their banjos and guitars and saxophones, and we have a dance party right there on the shore, free at last. It's a beautiful moment. But as we all know, parties must come to an end. And I imagine that the whole people turns together away from the water, and what they see is the most vast and terrifying wilderness they could ever imagine. The people remember how Egyptians used to talk about this wilderness. To the ancient mind, the wilderness is death. The wilderness is chaos. The wilderness is the last place you go. It is devoid of life and possibility. So the people begin to walk together into this desolate wasteland Maybe for the first few days, people still have a spring in their step, but it does not take long until an unrest sweeps over the entire people. Unrest turns to desperation. Desperation turns to flat out chaos. And so the people quarrel with Moses. They quarrel. It's kind of a lightweight English word that we don't really use that often, but 
But in the Hebrew, this word contains fear and suffering and bewilderment. Picture the whole assembly with their chapped desert lips and their brittle journeyed legs crying and screaming out in their leader's ear. Moses, give us something to drink. Moses, my children are thirsty. God, where are you? Do you even care about us anymore? Moses, did you just bring us out here to die? Were we slaves for 400 years in Egypt just to bury our family and friends in the sand? The people are so enraged and enraptured in their thirst that Moses apparently thinks they're about ready to take him out. So Moses cries out to God and says, what in the world am I supposed to do with these people? Layman's translation Help. The people question. Moses questions. It's a striking feature in this story that the speech of Moses and the people comes to us in this text almost entirely as questions. Why are we here? Why did you take us out? Where is God? What am I supposed to do? Why, why, where, what, why, why, where, what? I don't know about you, but I feel this text deeply in my bones today. This is a very human story because we all know what it's like to wander in the wilderness. The wilderness is that place where we are really honest with ourselves about how we are really doing. Have you ever had that experience where somebody comes up to you and says, hey, how are you? And they're super excited. And we all know that the correct answer is, oh, I'm great, thanks, how are you? But have you ever just wanted to be fully honest? Even with someone you don't know that well, even with somebody at church? How are you? Maybe you would say, I'm not well. I need help. I'm stuck. I'm so lonely. I'm so cut up with grief and loss. I'm so anxious about my future. I'm so sick and tired of worrying about money. I am journeying with someone who is dealing with the darkness of mental illness and I don't know how to help. I'm taking the SAT next week and I'm terrified that it will define who I become. I hate my job. I'm caught up in a terrible addiction and I don't know the way out. I'm in the wilderness. How are you really doing? What is the personal wilderness that you carried with you today into this place? See, our society has taught us to be so neat and tidy. It's taught us to keep the wilderness inside. Many Sundays we worship here together and many of us dealing with pain and most of the time keeping it to ourselves. Not only do we carry a personal wilderness with us, but as we look out into the world, it's impossible not to notice the cultural and societal wilderness as well. Every morning, I wake up, and I don't know why I do this, but I look at my dumb news app on my iPhone, knowing that I will find nothing there but bad news and strife and conflict. Nothing but wilderness. We are in the wilderness in so many ways. We are in the wilderness because storms have taken houses and loved ones from people near to and far from us. We are in the wilderness because it feels like not a week goes by without another school shooting or another terrorist attack or another moral failure by a community leader on either side or another uprising that claims that people of color or refugees or immigrants are not human beings. 
We are in the wilderness because since the November election, we have been farther apart from one another than we have ever been before. We have been taught to turn people who think and vote differently from us into enemies, into people to hate and despise and mock, even in the church, the one place where we are supposed to be one together. We are in the wilderness because there are so many people in our world that are thirsty for hope and for joy and for rest and for new life. So many. What is your wilderness? In what places in the world do you wish and pray for new life and restoration to come? The story of Israel's wilderness might help us find our way through this. This story points to one significant, huge question. Where is God when we are in the wilderness? The answer for Moses and for the people is quite a surprise, as is usually the case with God. I wonder what Moses thought with these screaming people as God told him, Moses, why don't you go take a walk through the gauntlet of that angry, thirsty people toward an unknown rock called Horeb? Where Horeb is matters, though, much less than what Horeb means. In the beautiful Hebrew language, Horeb means parched, thirsty, dry place. So in the middle of a terrible wilderness, in the midst of a screaming crowd, in the most parched, dry, thirsty place that wilderness has to offer, God says, I will be standing there upon the rock. And Moses, when you hit the rock, I will bring water into the wilderness, the freshest, sweetest water that you have ever tasted. It's a curious image, God standing upon this unknown rock. In the book of Exodus, God is pretty careful not to reveal God's full presence to the people. God is a voice, God is in a fiery bush, God is a pillar of cloud, God is a pillar of fire, God is breath, moving waves of the Red Sea. God is present, but not fully visible. Here and only here in this book does God come down with no boundary, no separation from him and the people. He is just standing there. Why here? Why now? Perhaps a part of the answer is a quote that Karl Barth once said, which is God chooses the worst things that happen to us and turns it into the best of what God can do for us. God comes down because God does his best work in the wilderness, in mine and in yours. Right there, in the most parched, thirsty, dry place. That is the place where God will come down. It would be easier if he would just yank us out of the wilderness, but instead he says, I know what it's like. I know your wilderness. I feel the heat of it. I am standing in the thick of it, and I will not leave. It's no wonder that Jesus chose to spend 40 days in the wilderness, thirsty, before his ministry began. It's no wonder that two of the last words that Jesus speaks from the cross are, I thirst. I know what it's like to be thirsty in the wilderness. I have been there before. All of this reminds me of one of my favorite parables. It's not a parable in the Gospels, it's kind of another kind of Gospel, the show The West Wing. 
So there's this guy walking down the road, and he falls into a pit so deep and dark that he can't get out. So he starts screaming for help. A doctor walks by, and he says, hey, doctor, can you help me out? Doctor writes a prescription, throws it down in the pit, keeps on walking. Farmer Joe comes by, says, hey, Farmer Joe, can you help me out? Farmer Joe throws some seed and some soil down in the pit, keeps on walking. A Presbyterian minister comes by, says, hey, Rev, can you help me out? The Rev writes a little scripture on a piece of paper, throws it down, keeps on walking. But a friend comes by. He says, hey, friend, neighbor, can you help me out? And the friend just jumps right down in the pit. He says, what are you doing? What are you doing down here? Now we're both stuck and we're not gonna get out. And the friend says, yeah, but I've been here before and I know the way out. God knows our wilderness. God has been in that pit with us before and God knows the way out. But the wilderness, of course, is not just about us and God one-on-one. -on -one. It's about all of us, the whole world and God together. In our New Testament lesson for today, Jesus knows as much. He's at this amazing feast, maybe similar to the feast that we'll have later today. This feast was called Sukkot. It was a time for people to remember the wilderness. They probably told stories much like the one that we just heard today. So as the people are gathered for this wilderness feast, on the last and greatest day, Jesus gets up and dares to say, streams of living water will flow from within you. From within you. Jesus knows that we cannot walk alone in the wilderness. We all know what it's like to have somebody jump down into that pit with us, right? Someone to sit with us, someone to hold us, someone to bear our burdens with us, someone who becomes like living water in a very dry, very parched place. It's precisely because we know the wilderness so well that Jesus says, you now are living water. You are that water that is gushing out of that rock. You can give life to someone in the wilderness and the people, they are thirsty. It's a strange mystery of life that though the wilderness wounds us, it also equips us to be healers to others. Though the wilderness wounds us, it equips us to be healers of others. As Henry Nouwen says it, we are wounded healers, each one of us. We are water in the wilderness, each one of us. So whatever your wilderness May you know today and forevermore that God is standing right there in the thick of it with you and God will never leave nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. And may you know that you are God's living water to others. You are water in the wilderness of others. So this week, as you leave and you enter into someone else's wilderness, which I promise you, you will, because we all have them, and it may even be in the midst of your own, you can turn to them and look them in the eye and say, I've been here before, and I know the way out. <laughs>